Amen. Good morning. My name is Bonnie Hawk, and I am a pastor and also now a furniture maker. So I used to work primarily with words, and now I work primarily with wood. And there's nothing like working with a new medium to make you appreciate the old medium. I miss words because they are so obedient. They do not splinter. They do not tear out. They do not lose moisture content. Words are not susceptible to the change of temperature or humidity or the ash borer. You just pull words out of the air and string them into an order, sentence after sentence, and voila, you have crafted a sermon. The major downside I see about words, however, is that talk is cheap. Words are often cheap. Wood is many things, but if you've been to the lumber store lately, you know it is definitively not cheap. I remember one of my seminary professors talking about the relative power of words. This was 15 years ago, and so it's a bit fuzzy now, but he told us something about the two German words for the word word. In German, you have Heselwort and Thedelwort. Now, Hazelwort means something of an ordinary word, she, or cucumber, or the dog walked to the park. But Thedelwort is a word that is anything but cheap. A Thedelwort is a word that does something. Let there be light, God said, and there was light. Thedelworts are words that affect a new reality. They do something by the sheer utterance of the word itself. Like when the priest says over communion, pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. That's a Thedelwort. Lest you think that only priests can offer these reality-bending words, see what happens when you say to someone for the first time, I love you, or will you marry me, or... I'm expecting. See new realities come into being at the utterance of these thedelworts. The author and scholar Eugene Peterson suggests a different categorization of words. He suggests that there are three types of language. First, there is a language that we use for communicating information. So think textbooks and NPR radio or a a lost dog sign in the park. Second, there is a language of persuasion. Think commercials persuading you to buy, or friends inviting you over for dinner, or a pastor telling you to please sign up. These two types of language dominate our world today. We communicate and we convince. We exchange information and assert our opinions at incredibly high speed and with no shortage of cheap, cheap words. But there is another kind of language, Peterson insists. In fact, it is our native tongue. This is the language that mothers and newborn babies speak. It might come out as total gibberish, ooing and aahing and cooing. It's not meant to convey convey important truths to the baby or to convince the baby of this or that hypothesis, but somehow words are spoken, syllables strung together for the sheer purpose of deepening that relationship between mother and child. It's for building intimacy, enacting love. Peterson calls it the language of intimacy. Unfortunately, very few people speak this language anymore. Parents, mystics, poets, a few saints, and occasionally middle school lovers who find themselves inexplicably talking in baby talk to each other. You might say that prayer belongs to this category of language. We don't pray to inform God of things God already doesn't know, or even really to persuade God of things. We can try. 
Mostly we pray to build intimacy, to deepen our relationship with the divine. Now all this to say that somewhere between what Peterson calls the language of intimacy and what the Germans call a Thedelwort, a word that does something, is what Christians mean when we talk about blessing. And the last thing Jesus does in his earthly ministry, standing before the disciples on Ascension Day, is to offer them a blessing. Luke tells the story like this. After the resurrection and the road to Emmaus, when the disciples were all gathered together in Jerusalem, Jesus appeared in the midst of them. First, he explained a bunch of things to the disciples. Note, language of communication. Then, he told them where to go and what to do. Note, language of persuasion. And lastly, he blessed them. Language of intimacy. And while he was blessing them, the scripture tells us, while he was blessing them, Jesus was taken into heaven. I've often had people admit to me that they try to pray at night, at bedtime, but they often fall asleep while praying. And they wonder if that upsets God. I've always thought that's a beautiful way to fall asleep, while in the very act of praying, much in the same way that Jesus ascends to heaven while in the very act of blessing. It seems like a pretty good way to go out to me. Earlier in the Gospels, we are given the full text of what might be the most beautiful blessing ever recorded, the Beatitudes. Jesus begins his ministry saying, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. But this time, when it comes to the end of Jesus' ministry on earth, we are not given the full text or even the cliff notes of the blessing. All we know is Jesus blessed them, and that it must have taken a while because it was still going on when the Spirit decided time was up. So I think there is an invitation for us here to imagine not only what sort of blessing that could have been, but why and how we bless each other today. How might we be the ones to fall asleep while blessing, to come to the end of our lives still blessing? What is a blessing anyway? How would you define that word? I've said already that it is somewhere between a fatal vort and the language of intimacy. But how do we bless others in a world where too often talk is cheap? If you'll permit me, I want to tell a few stories that might seem to have nothing to do with church at all, because the word blessing itself, hashtag blessed, has become cheap either overly or underly religious, I'm not quite sure, that I like to challenge myself sometimes to see the things of God without any religious context at all. So I have a friend, Brian, who has taught dance class for the last 15 years, every week, at the same place and the same time. And for the last couple of years, I have been a student in his dance class. So for two hours every Wednesday night, he would teach us the ways of Lindy Hop and Charleston. We'd rotate partners, learn new skills, practice old ones. We listened to the same 10 songs on his beginner jazz playlist over and over again. <coughs> Brian is a great teacher, energetic, and Lindy Hop is a pretty athletic dance. So by the end of two hours of class, you're pretty much fried. You just want to go home. But Brian does this thing at the, every, at the end of every single class. He'd turn off the music and he'd say, gather around, gather around, you beautiful people. And he'd wait until we'd all kind of shuffled over. And he'd say, that was, that was a great class today. You guys look so good out there. So I want you to go find a social dance and go out dancing. Take what you've learned here and go enjoy it. 
and he'd look at us with these big loving eyes and an encouraging smile, and he does this at the end of every single class, every single week, for 15 years. And one evening, our whole class went out to a restaurant after dance class. There were maybe 15 of us at this divey restaurant, the only place in town open past 9 p.m. on a Wednesday. And I went over to Brian and I sat down next to him and I said, Brian, I know you're not a churchgoer, but we have this part of our worship service in church at the very end where the pastor stands up and holds out their hands and offers a blessing. It's called the benediction. And it's not supposed to be like a sermon, definitely not a rehashing of the sermon. You just kind of, you look lovingly at the people and you just hold them in this moment of shared belovedness and you bless them. And you know what? I just realized that that is exactly what you do at the end of every single dance class. You gather us around, and you bless us, and look at this community that now exists because of your words. And Brian got quiet, and he just held his hands over his heart for a minute. I knew he was a Catholic who had given up faith a long time ago but I could see in his eyes how much it meant for him to be told by the weird pastor in his dance class that I saw his work as a blessing. Perhaps that conversation in the restaurant was my way of blessing him as he had week after week blessed me. What is a blessing exactly? How do we define it? Contrary to the old mantra, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me, words have power. They have the power to build up a community or break it down, to bless or to curse. Over the last year or so, I have begun to refer to myself not only as a pastor, but as a furniture maker. Or if I'm feeling really gutsy, I tell people that I am a chair maker, even though I have only made two and a half chairs. <laughs> There's something really important to me about claiming those words, chair maker, that has affected my reality like a fatal board, like I'm willing it into being. Now to be a chair maker, and I'm talking old fashioned Windsor chairs, Appalachian style post and rung chairs, ladder back chairs, to be a chair maker is to enter into a kind of language of chair making and a wisdom of chair making that has been passed down from generation to generation. Because how else would you know how to start with a log, split it open with wedges, rive it with froes, shape spindles with a draw knife, carve seats with a travisher, and turn it into a chair with perfect proportions, a chair that will last for a hundred years or more. The only way we do it is with the blessing of another's wisdom and the wisdom of another before that. When we talk about blessings, we often think of older people, parents or grandparents blessing a child's marriage. I think of Jacob stealing his brother Esau's blessing from their father in his old age. You know, in the first half of life, we figure out how to get more and more. And in the second half of life, we figure out how to give it away. So me still being in the first half of my life, I recently began to look for someone in Maryland who could teach me the wisdom of chair making. Not a video, not a YouTube channel, a person. So I began where all the generations have begun, on Google. I Googled chair makers, Maryland. And what I discovered is that one of the greats, one of the most well-loved figures in all of chair making is from Baltimore, right here. Jenny Alexander was a devoted chair maker who adapted the traditional Appalachian post and rung chair, designing it, tweaking it to make this glorious version of it that we lovingly call the Jenny chair in her honor. 
Now, Jenny had a phrase that she used to love to say all the time. She would say, wood is wonderful. She came up in my Google search because of her book, Make a Chair from a Tree, which begins like this. Chapter one. I am a chair maker. My name is Jenny Alexander. Before 2007, I was John Alexander. I thank all those who have been supportive and kind. Indeed, times change, people change. Wood continues to be wonderful. Wood is wonderful, she would always say. A statement that is kind of like a blessing in and of itself, don't you think? At least it belongs to the language of intimacy. It's not a statement about grain direction in wood or moisture content. It's a thing we say to one another to inspire relationship with each other and with the very tree that will turn into our chair. Jenny Alexander wrote a whole book that reads like that opening paragraph, making accessible to people the wisdom of chair making. Now sadly, she passed away in the middle of writing the third edition of her book. Or should I say that her time was up while she was in the very act of blessing us with her wisdom and love for these chairs. But some of her colleagues and students got together to finish the book. Their names and photographs are included in the third edition as contributors. And because of that, and my excellent Googling, and one handwritten letter to the publishing company, I was able to find what I had been looking for, someone in Maryland to teach me chair making. Jenny had a friend, a student, who happens to live 20 minutes from my wood shop. He is retired in the second half of his life and committed to giving away the knowledge he earned from Jenny Alexander. I now call him my chair mentor and he comes to my wood shop once a week usually showing up with some hand tool that I don't own, but I desperately need to lend me for the foreseeable future. He's got stories to tell about Jenny and encouragement to offer and a deep humility and wisdom. And a few weeks ago, I asked him to sign my copy of Jenny Alexander's book, Make a Chair from a Tree. He was, after all, a contributor. He paused for a moment. I don't think anyone had ever asked him to sign this book before. I could tell the moment touched him. He somewhat sheepishly took the pen and the book from my hand. To Bonnie, he wrote, wood is wonderful. What is a blessing? How do we define it? Those words, wood is wonderful, surely that's a blessing, but it's more than that. It's also his life that has become a blessing to me, and Jenny's life before his. Jesus gave us the Beatitudes. He also became our Beatitude. And maybe that's why we don't have the text of his Ascension Day blessing. Jesus, the Word, had become a living Thetelvort, whose very presence ushered in the reign of God. How will your life also become a living blessing? Perhaps it already is. A friend of mine, a Catholic priest, told me once about going to a mass in Rome attended by many cardinals and the well-known Taizé monk, Brother Roger. Brother Roger was a tremendous man of deep faith, and this priest, my friend, he could not wait to meet him and speak with him after the service. He told me he had so many questions he wanted to ask Brother Roger. The Mass was exceptionally beautiful, and when it was over, most of the guests made a beeline to talk to the cardinals, but my friend, he went straight for Brother Roger. Brother Roger was clearly taken with the beauty of what had just transpired in the Mass. He greeted him with a handshake, and Brother Roger said simply, Quelle joie, quelle joie, which means, what joy, what joy. And my friend the priest 
suddenly didn't need to say anything more to him at all. A blessing is a word that does something. It is the language of intimacy. And perhaps its third and final element is this, joy. Luke tells the Ascension Day story like this, Jesus lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left and was taken into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. We go out as a blessing when even in our absence there is joy left behind. So friends, how can I end this sermon quickly now before my words become cheap? I guess all that's left to say is, God is good, wood is wonderful, what joy, what joy. Amen.